much. We now resume with the final uh, portfolio question session, and the final portfolio is health and sport. As ever, if members wish to ask a supplementary on another member's questions, please enter R in the chat function. And I am keen to get as many members in as I can, so please keep questions and answers as succinct as possible. And can we start with question one, Alison Harris. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making in, in its commitment to carry out weekly COVID-19 tests on all care home workers. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. So, as the member knows, I uh, advised the Chamber on the 19th of May that all care home staff would be offered COVID-19 testing, regardless of symptoms, and that this would be undertaken every seven days. And I uh, can confirm that all care home staff in Scotland now have access to that weekly testing. Of course, not all staff are available every week. Staff may well be on holiday or off sick, on maternity leave or on other leave. So our agreed aim is to test 70% of available staff. The latest statistics for the week commencing the 14th of August show that 36,986 staff were tested, which is a proportion of staff available is over 75%. All care homes have access to the UK social care portal since the 8th of June, and we have secured 67,900 tests per week, with over 90% of our care homes uh, ordering through the portal. Alison Harris. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. However, despite the aim of 70%, which granted has been met, last week it was 17,000 of 53,000 staff failed to be tested. And in the five weeks prior to that, the numbers have ranged from nearly, well, nearly 17,000, 16,872 to 19,000. This is remaining high at a constant, slightly over a third of staff. Clearly, all those staff can't fall into the category of holiday, sick pay, or maternity leave categories. So, what other explanation can the Cabinet Secretary offer for these failed and missed tests? Cabinet Secretary. So, just so we are factually accurate, in terms of the percentage of available staff tested uh, for the last uh, six weeks, it has gone from 69% to 72, to 75, 76. Two weeks in a row, and actually the week commencing 14th of August, it was 77.7%. In that time, so this is one of the explanations, uh, the number of staff who are declining to be tested uh, has reduced from uh, just over 2,500 in a week to, in the most recent week for which we have uh, figures, 1,014. But not all of our care homes. Uh, are in any one week uh, either uh, participating in the uh, weekly testing or in that week uh, do we have all of their results back in. So uh, in every week there will be some missing results, but there are also a declining number, uh, I'm pleased to say, of both staff declining testing and care homes participating in testing. Having now made the regular participation in weekly testing one of the criteria that care homes must meet in order, for example, to uh, take part in the extension of visiting through the designated indoor visitor for each resident, uh, I am sure that we will see an increase both in the numbers of care homes uh, participating in this weekly testing regime, but also in the number of staff. We have addressed some of the issues with staff, uh, as the member knows, particularly through the uh, social care fund uh, with the cooperation and uh, the initiation from Ms Lennon. That fund addresses the poor terms and conditions of some staff who were only receiving statutory sick pay if they tested positive and were therefore fearful of being tested at all, lest that positive test be returned because the reduction in their income would be so significant and so harmful to them and their family. Uh, we have a group uh, working with unions, my officials, Scottish Care, looking every week at the uh, particular issues that might be uh, 
preventing uh, staff participating in testing or a care home participating in the programme and looking to resolve that in real time. Brief supplementary, please. Willie Coffey. Thank you. Could I also ask the Cabinet Secretary if she able to provide a brief update on the work of that short life consultation group, which was established with union and care home management reps, to understand those concerns a bit better about staff having weekly testing? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, the, the short life working group has met on six separate occasions. And as I said uh, earlier, it has looked at a number of key operational issues. So it's very task focused, if you like, uh, and looked to how we can resolve those. Most of them have now been addressed. They've included the introduction of full weekly ordering of test kits to make the ordering burden, if you like, uh, on care homes uh, less onerous, Bulking, bulk uploading of tests once completed, amendments in terms of the user guidance for the social care portal, and we have also uh, produced a video uh, encouraging staff to participate in staff testing. The group will continue to work uh, exploring any issues that are raised with us, either from the unions concerned through their membership or, or from care home managers themselves. Further brief supplementary, Jackie Bailey. Cabinet Secretary will be aware of my repeated requests for local testing facilities, both for care home staff and indeed for local residents in my area. Last week, I had parents and their children being told to travel to Dunoon, Stirling and Edinburgh. Indeed, this week, it was even further afield to Belfast and to Carlisle. So will the Cabinet Secretary tell NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde provide local facilities in Dumbarton, the Vale of Leaven, or indeed Helensburgh, both for care home staff, and so that sick children aren't having to travel hundreds of miles. Cabinet Secretary. So Ms Bailey raises a really important question here, and uh, as I'm sure she knows, there are at this particular point uh, a number of um, challenges being uh, faced by our testing regime. As she knows, and other members will do, uh, we uh, undertake that testing regime through two main routes. Uh, the first of those is the UK portal, uh, where people can book a test, and the tests are processed through the Lighthouse Lab in Glasgow. That Lighthouse Lab is part of a network of three UK Lighthouse Labs, and uh, over uh, the whole of the UK, there has been an uh, upsurge in demand. Uh, that demand has then meant that uh, some of the testing facilities where you can go to be tested uh, have been capped at UK level, and the lab at Glasgow, the Lighthouse Lab in Glasgow, has uh, been undertaking more tests from south of the border, processing those tests, than from Scotland. All of that has created some of the difficulties that Ms uh, Bailey's uh, constituents and others have faced. We are working very hard with the UK uh, government to resolve these issues, and we are also working hard to increase our NHS capacity for testing, which is the other route that we use, so that we can, if we have to, um, re-divert some of those dedicated testing groups that includes care home workers, um, teachers, NHS staff, and others through the NHS route if that is what we need to do. So all of that work is underway. The additional point I would make that may um, help uh, in Ms Bailey's particular instance is the introduction of walk-in centres. The first of those will open in St Andrews uh, next week. Uh, there will be then another 10 rolled out across Scotland, uh, initially focused um, particularly around our university student population, which as you know, will grow considerably over the coming weeks. But following those, a further uh, group of walk-in centres will be introduced. And I've already uh, made it clear to my officials that I want to see those centres pick up in areas like um, Ms. Dumbar Ms. Uh, Bailey's area, uh, Inverclyde, and other parts of the country, where there is a high population uh, but limited accessibility to local testing facilities. Thanks very much. Can I remind all members of the need for succinct questions and answers? 
and call question two, Maurice Golden. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis it has carried out of the physical and mental health impact on fitness facilities and served during the COVID-19 pandemic. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. The Scottish Government recognises the impact of indoor sport and physical activities being closed, and we appreciate the cooperation shown by the public and the industry, which has allowed us to ease restrictions and permit indoor facilities to open from the 31st of August with physical distancing and enhanced hygiene measures in place. We will shortly be publishing detailed impact assessments uh, on the impact of restrictions on a range of activities, including fitness uh, facilities and services. I thank the Minister for that answer. Many activities have been dealt a huge blow these past months, for example, grassroots football. The Third Sector Resilience Fund can help, but it is short term. Physical, mental benefits of local football clubs, especially youth clubs. Does the Minister targeted support to ensure our national game survives at a local level? Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. So I think I, I missed some of the question, but I think it was basically about uh, grassroots sport in, in general and um, football in, in particular. And, and the member is absolutely right about the importance of grassroots sports in terms of the physical um, uh, health and mental health um, of, of our population. Um, so we've been working very closely with the uh, Scottish Football Association and other sports governing bodies to. Um, through Sports Scotland, in order to um, maintain as much uh, work from those those sports governing bodies to support um, ongoing physical activity, and we've seen some really amazing um, examples of innovation, um, not not just through the use of um, technology, but that's kind of I guess been most notable about how um, various sports governing bodies have used technology to encourage, encourage their members to. Um, to keep physically active, but I absolutely recognise the challenge that we have in, in effectively catching up for lost time um, that has been lost during the lockdown. Thank you. Question three, James Kay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it is taking to tackle health inequalities arising from COVID-19. Government Secretary Jim Green. Question. Uh, there are a number of actions that we are taking. Uh, for the sake of brevity, I will only list uh, two or three of those. Uh, the first was the setting up of the independent expert reference group on COVID-19 and ethnicity, which brings together experts, representative groups and academics in this field, looking at the data and evidence uh, on the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on those from our minority ethnic communities. Uh, the groups already made recommendations, which we are uh, featuring in our board mobilisation plans, and those plans have been asked to specifically make sure that they are considering how we proceed with health inequalities. We have also provided additional support to protect some of our most vulnerable people, with uh, over two million to assure additional help and support for those at risk as a result of drug and alcohol use and over one and a half million to third sector organisations to provide emergency hotel accommodation and support for people experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness during the pandemic. There will be further actions planned uh, by the government in response to what we have learned from the Equality and Fairer Scotland impact assessments that have been ready carried out in the development and implementation of our route map measures and as I mentioned uh, earlier in the answer, with a particular respect to the board mobilisation plans currently being looked at and assessed, and will be part of the discussion at the recovery group, which, as the member knows, I chair. James Kelly. Thank the cabinet secretary for that answer. Yesterday's report from Public Health Scotland uh, highlighted the fact that high excess deaths over lockdown. Um, can be result from the, the health service not being used by those who most need it. Given the high rate of deaths in the poorest communities, I ask the Cabinet Secretary if she is concerned that a slow reopening of the health service will further escalate health inequalities. Cabinet Secretary. 
<clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> the member raises a really important point, and it is about uh, how how well we can improve the access to healthcare facilities, uh, health screening programs, uh, and uh, primary and community-based care by those uh, who uh, are most in need of that access and that care. The, the reopening of our NHS services and the pace at which we are safely able to do that is not, I don't believe, the dominant factor here. It is, for example, how well we can roll out community link workers, how much we can learn from the um, evidence and the impact of, for example, the uh, deep end practices, uh, how we can ensure that our focus in remobilising our NHS is uh, very much on primary community and social care and not exclusively on hospital-based care. And that is part of the commission, if you like, that each of our health boards was set by me and is the work that we've got underway, including a subgroup to that recovery group looking in particular at primary and community health care. Thank you very much. Question for Peter Chapman. I thank you, Deputy President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason only one of 30 bars in Aberdeen has reportedly been asked to provide its contact tracing list since the implementation of the local lockdown. Cabinet Secretary Jean Freeman. So the, the decisions on how to respond in detail to any cluster of cases or outbreak that follows from that is very much a decision that is led by the local incident management team um, in terms of uh, their understanding of the trigger case, if you like, uh, and the circumstances around that and where the other cases have come and how they have uh, linked uh, one to the other. So if you look, for example, at the way in which the local IMT in Dumfries and Galloway responded to that outbreak compared to the IMT in Lanarkshire to that particular outbreak compared to Aberdeen, you will see that there, is a, there are core uh, actions that run through all of them, but they apply that expert knowledge and understanding on health protection to the particular circumstances. So the local IMT uh, looked at uh, what it needed to know. It started with the Hawthorne Bar, which was the one bar that they asked for contact details from. They got those in paper and in digital form, and they could then see and trace uh, individuals, individual contacts from contacts, further contacts. That let them understand the number of um, premises in the nighttime economy that were impacted without having to ask each of those premises for the specific contact details that they might be collecting. And the IMT debated uh, more than once uh, how best to deal with those different premises, and as the member knows, in the end, uh, concluded that the right way to deal with that and make sure that everyone who may be affected or may be concerned or may be anxious uh, knew what they were doing was to uh, publish the details of all the premises they knew uh, may have had uh, an individual who was a contact of the original cases in those premises, but they may not have been in the premises for long enough or in close enough contact with another uh, to qualify as a close contact. Well, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer, but I, I don't actually accept it. You know, many bars in Aberdeen connected to the COVID outbreak have reported that no one from Environmental Health or NHS Grampian has attempted to contact them or to gather their contact list. And I think this is a complete dereliction of duty and further highlights the failings of the Scottish Government's track and trace system, and I believe it inevitably meant the lockdown lasted for longer than necessary. So can the Cabinet Secretary give a commitment to Parliament that lessons have been learned and that businesses will be involved in future contact tracing instead of being left in the dark as they were in Aberdeen? Cabinet Secretary. Well, regrettably, Mr Chapman has got absolutely no evidence at all for the assertion he's just been made. Uh, the, the NHS Test and Protect 
programme is proving itself to be highly effective in a range of different outbreaks from uh, Dumfries and Galloway around Gretna and Annan, right through to a complex outbreak in Aberdeen, uh, to the current one that is uh, successfully being managed in Tayside. All of them different, all of them complex, uh, and all of them being managed effectively because we do not have a blanket national approach, but rest on the expertise of public health professionals through the IMT, working with local authorities, the NHS boards, uh, and other colleagues. So I don't accept what Mr. Chapman has said at all. I will give no such guarantee because I do not think a politician should overrule the professional expertise of clinicians, uh, health protection uh, experts, uh, public health uh, academics, and others who also know their local area. That's why our Test and Protect programme works so successfully, because it is that combination of national support and local expertise that is so far proving to be a very effective test and protect system. Question five, Murdo Fraser. I'm afraid Murder Fraser's question was not audible. I wonder if that can be addressed. No, I'm afraid Mr. Fraser's question was not heard. Uh, I'm looking at the Cabinet Secretary, and I think she is of the same uh, experience. I wonder if it's possible to uh, come back to Mr. Fraser. If not, we'll move on and hope to come back to Mr. Fraser, uh, if time allows. Uh, and can I take question six, Bill Bowen? Uh, thank you, Standing Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what analysis the drugs the Drug Deaths Task Force has made of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic. Minister Joe Fitzpatrick. Both the Task Force and I were acutely aware of the risks that the pandemic and the resulting changes in how services were delivered as a result of lockdown measures could pose to those relying upon treatment and support. Task Force have continued to meet regularly throughout the pandemic and took forward a range of work to mitigate these risks. That included the rapid development of a series of recommendations that were implemented by the Scottish Government and others. I thank the Minister for that answer. Fake Valium and drugs from so-called pill presses have anecdotally had a crippling effect on health in Dundee, where etizolam-related deaths rocketed by 500% in 2018. The drug deaths toll for 2019 will not be known until December, the earliest I understand and experts are feeling the worst. Can the minister indicate whether the task force believes COVID will have, had, will have affected deaths caused by these drugs? Minister Joe so, Fitzpatrick. So the, the member um, question around fake Valium is, is hugely, hugely important. It's something that really concerns me. And I think anecdotally, um, we are hearing increasing concern around this across Scotland. Um, I think this is one of the areas where hopefully ourselves and our UK government colleagues can work together on. Right now, you can go online, I won't name uh, particular websites, but you can go online and buy a pill press for a relatively small amount of money that can churn these lethal pills out um, by the thousands. Um, I, I can't understand um, a justification for such devices, so I really hope this is something that we can work um, the Scottish Government, UK Government, the Welsh Government and Northern Irish Government work together to regulate the sale of these pill presses, which I, I think are, are potentially responsible for a large amount of that um, really dangerous uh, street valium and, and other pills which are circulating around Scotland and elsewhere in the UK. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Can we see if Murdo Fraser is now able to ask his question? No, I'm afraid. I'm afraid Mr. Fraser remains uh, uncharacteristically silent, um, and so we'll move very rapidly uh, to Joan McAlpine. And apologies to Mr. Fraser. Joan McAlpine. Whether it will fully implement the recommendations of the Cumberledge Review regarding children damaged by sodium valproate, and if so, what the time scales will be? Our Cabinet Secretary. Thank you very much. And before I answer this, I will provide Mr. Fraser with a written answer uh, to his question. And uh, if he has further uh, answer, uh, questions he wants to give me, then I'd be very happy to respond to those uh, offline, as it were. In terms of Ms McAlpine's question, I have welcomed the uh, Baroness Cumberledge report, and I know that a number of patients in Scotland provided evidence to her review. The review related primarily to NHS England and processes in England more generally, uh, but there are lessons uh, and implications for us here in Scotland. So we're giving careful consideration to all the recommendations of the report, and we'll give a response. Uh, very shortly to all of those. Our sodium valparate advisory group met earlier this month. It is chaired by our chief pharmaceutical officer to discuss the review and the next steps to be applied at a Scottish level. Uh, this week, uh, our officials met with representatives from patient groups to listen to their concerns and inform future action and our response. So, as we finalise the detail of that, uh, we'll certainly make sure that not only Ms McAlpine, but all members are aware of how we intend to take forward those recommendations and the timescale within which we'll do that. Thank you very much for that answer. My constituents, Charlie and Leslie Bethune, contacted me for help as their adopted daughter, Autumn, age seven, has fetal valparate spectrum disorder caused by her birth mother having taken this drug to control seizures during pregnancy, Mr. and Mrs. Bethian are members of the newly formed First Do, Not ha First Do No Harm Valprate Scotland campaign group. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary did mention that she had met with patients' groups. Can she confirm that this parents' group will be represented in any task force form to take forward the report recommendations so that they can help shape a package of care and support for children like Autumn, who have very considerable needs indeed? Cabinet Secretary. So I'm grateful to Ms McAlpine for that additional question. Um, uh, whether or not there is a task force as such uh, will be primarily for the UK government to respond to in terms of the Cumberledge report. In terms of our response as a Scottish government, uh, we will, uh, as I've said, already been uh, speaking to make sure that we uh, hear the patient voice uh, and that particular uh, sodium valparate uh, advisory group it uh, will ensure that it, it reaches out so that it can hear uh, what patients' experience has been uh, and engage them in helping to uh, form our recommendations. We will look to do that across all the areas of the Cumberledge report uh, as we respond to it. Thank you very much. And uh, my apologies to both Murdo Fraser and Mark Ruskell, uh, as well as to other colleagues who wished uh, supplementary questions. Uh, but we really are out of time, uh, so uh, that now concludes portfolio questions on health and sport, and I close this meeting of Parliament.